Good evening and welcome to the Conscious and Justice Council Today program. I'm your host, Edward Woods III, Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Director for the Lake Region Conference and Chairperson of the Conscious and Justice Council. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an all-star panel put together and we are excited about the opportunity to talk about the implications of Roe versus Wade. Just kind of want to set the stage. This is a conversation conversation. Once again, I repeat, this is a conversation, a way to get information. If you have questions, we ask you to put them in the chat and we will answer your questions. But right now, we want you to get the word out. Tell your family, tell your friends, tell those in your sphere of influence that we will be addressing the implications of Roe versus Wade from a religious liberty standpoint, a legal standpoint, a medical standpoint, a justice standpoint, and a theological standpoint. Once again, we welcome your questions. We ask that you be respectful one with another, and we're excited about this opportunity to present these fantastic speakers that we have this evening. For those of you who are not familiar with the Conscience and Justice Council, we're representative of the public affairs and religious liberty directors across the United States at the local level, at the union level, as well as the um, North American division level. We have people that are practitioners. We have lawyers. We have a great diverse group of people that participate as a member of the board. If you want to know more information, you can go to www.cjcouncil.org. Once again, www.cjcouncil.org. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests who are going to come and talk about the legal analysis of this case as well as the religious liberty implications. Um, our guest from Walla Walla University, the professor of philosophy and lawyer himself, Timothy J. Golden. From the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, the Associate General Counsel, and the one who's the expert and the lead in all things religious liberty, Todd McFarland. The president of the Church State Council, which is affiliated with the Pacific Union Conference, um, Esquire, Esquire, Alan J. Reinick. It's nothing like having a recent law student grad from American University by the way of Oakwood University. Please welcome the distinguished lawyer, I'm sorry, distinguished recent graduate from a Juris Doctorate, Nia Langley. And then we have also the professor of church history, a lawyer himself from Andrews University, the public affairs and religious liberty director for the Lake Union Conference and the general counsel for the Lake Union Conference. Please welcome another friend of ours today, Nicholas Miller. Lady and gentlemen, we want you to um, share your legal analysis of the implications of the overturn versus Roe versus Wade. As you all know, it's been there for 50 years. What are the legal analysis? What are the implications? And then after that, we want to have a conversation as to what that means as it relates to religious liberty, what that means as it relates to religious, religious liberty. Um, we'll start off with Tim, then we'll go with Todd, and then we'll go with Nick, Nia, and end with Alan. Tim, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Yes, good evening, Woody, and thank you for having me. And uh, just a, a robust hello to you and to all my fellow panelists. I'm, I'm blessed to be in this space tonight. Well, today was, I think, for anyone who actually heard the oral argument in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, the case out of Mississippi that actually overturned Roe versus Wade today, I think it was predictable that this was going to happen. In the oral argument, the attorney general for Mississippi uh, was pretty straightforward in the claims that he was making that it was time for Roe to be overturned because it had become unworkable and so forth. Uh, in, in looking at Justice Alito's majority opinion from a legal standpoint, he is, seems to be very committed to a sort of originalist, textualist view of the Constitution. And for those who are in the audience listening, what that means is that if we're going to analyze constitutional rights or things that purport to be constitutional rights, we have to begin with the text of the Constitution, and then we have to take a close look at what our 
constitutional heritage is and what our traditions are. And based on that analysis, Justice Alito concluded uh, very strongly that in his estimation, Roe versus Wade was wrong when it was decided. Uh, I believe he used the phraseology egregiously wrong when it was decided that it's division into trimesters and the subsequent attempts of the court to regulate that in cases like Planned Parenthood versus Casey from 30 years ago was just unworkable. Um, when you take a look at some of the concurring opinions from a legal standpoint, it's interesting that the Chief Justice, although he concurred in the result of upholding the Mississippi statute, he was stopping short of going forward to overturn Roe completely. And then in another concurring opinion, which is probably the most disturbing one of the bunch, Justice Thomas calls for a radical re-examination in future cases of other right to privacy measures, such as contraception. He's calling for a reconsideration of Griswold versus Connecticut. And I just to put that in context, in Griswold versus Connecticut, a doctor was arrested for prescribing contraception to a married couple, to a married couple. And Justice Thomas is now calling for, in his concurrence, a radical reconsideration of the right of privacy decisions on that basis. I think, uh, and this will be my last point, I think that from a legal standpoint, what troubles me about the court's decision is that if you take the logic of Justice Alito's majority opinion seriously, it would seem to also imperil the First Amendment right of association, which actually is not in the First Amendment at all. It's a right of it's a right that we sort of cobbled together from other amendments, not unlike the right of privacy, which is theoretically rooted in the Liberty Clause of the 14th Amendment. And some scholars would have argued even in the Ninth Amendment. So I'm curious to see if the court is as intellectually consistent when it comes to a, a right of association, which is, again, not explicit in the First Amendment but is sort of cobbled together in a way similar to the right to abortion. And so I'm interested to see what happens. But I think if Justice Thomas is to be taken seriously in his concurrence from a legal standpoint, we should all be very concerned. So I would sort of follow up on that by saying a couple of things. Uh, first of all, Thomas's concurrence, the people who have been following his his jurisprudence, should be a very little surprise, right? He's been suspicious of and outright hostile to the what's known as the subsidy of due process clause for a very long time. I think it's also important he got no votes, right? I mean, it was just a single concurrence. Um, whether you think that's a good idea or not, of course, is up to you know different people's interpretation. But I think it would be a little disingenuous to take one concurrence that got no other votes and say that that is necessarily where the court's going, especially when the majority went out of its way to say that these other rights weren't being weren't implicated and should not be viewed that way. Now, what does that mean going down the road? Does that mean that you know that they might look at some of those decisions or some of the other subsidy of due process rights? I would not rule that out. I just don't think you can tell that from this opinion. I think abortion is very sui generis. It is unique in, in our jurisprudence and has had sort of unique implications, both politically and on our on sort of the democratic process that those other you know rules have, have not had. So for instance, if Griswold were overturned, I don't think there's any state that would, you know, go around banning uh, the type of contraception that was involved, you know, there. Um, so which I believe were barrier methods, if I remember correctly. Um, so, you know, where this goes from here, I think is, you know, is is an open question. But I think the dissents, you know, sort of saying, well, listen, all these other things on the chopping block, you know, I think really speaks to some extent about why Roe was and Casey, I should say, we really should be talking about them together because Casey was the more relevant decision, uh, you know, in the last several years with its, you know, undue burden sort of standard, or that's not the right phrase, I'm forgetting it right now, on, you know, undue hardship, I think it was on, on getting access to abortion. Um, 
you know, a lot of the arguments being made really were sort of policy, the impacts this has on poor women, et cetera. Um, and also, I think it's important to note, this does not outlaw abortion, right? Abortion will remain legal, in fact, protected in huge number of states. And if you look at it, if you look at it population wise, you got two of the biggest, California and New York, that have absolutely protected it. And Illinois is in the same category. I haven't seen the population breakdown. Um, and then in those states where it's not, you know, where it is going to be banned and so forth, of course, individuals have the right to, to, to go to other places. Something, by the way, I would say courts in other contexts on sort of the more liberal side have been very willing to embrace and saying something was constitutional. I think in particular when California passed its ban upon uh, conversion therapy. The Ninth Circuit opinion says, well, you can go to another state to get it. Therefore, it's not as big an imposition on your rights as you may think. So, you know, we'll see where this goes. Um, I think, you know, there's been a lot of hand wringing over this. Um, it will be interesting, in my view, to see sort of does this accomplish, you know, what the majority said it did, which is to take this issue out of the federal courts, or are we going to be, you know, wrestling in the federal courts moving forward? Edward, I guess it's uh, I guess it's my turn now, um, and there's such complexity here. I think that that Todd's final point is a very important one. Um, the impact of this decision will be very different depending on where you live in the country, right? Um, this has now taken what was a national debate and made it into a, de a debate in each one of our 50 states. And where we end up in some of the states, we're going to have an absolute uh, right to abortion, uh, fully protected, just as it has been previously. And in other states, we may have instances where there is no abortion at all, except in the most extreme cases of the, uh, of the life of the mother being endangered. I think we've seen draft legislation that doesn't even allow exceptions for rape and incest. We've seen legislation at least proposed that would um, um, penalize women who became pregnant and then left the state and uh, came back no longer pregnant. Um, I, I think that it, whether that will pass or not remains to be seen, uh, but we really are going um, back um, more than 50 years uh, in how, in the level of conflict this is going to produce. I'm rather surprised that the court sort of took the whole enchilada and uh, just directly overruled Roe versus Wade. Um, Chief Justice Roberts was trying for something much more incremental. I think Chief Justice Roberts is probably a wise man. If, you're, if your goal is to really uh, decrease abortion, to, to, to actually lower what's happening, uh, then you probably want to move this direction with the least conflict you can have. And by directly and immediately overthrowing Roe versus Wade, we're probably guaranteed a level of conflict in this country that a more graduated approach wouldn't have brought about. Um, I, I, I do think, you know, this is sort of a litmus test. Sometimes abortion is used as a, as a litmus test for either party. You must be against it if you're a Republican and you must be for it if you're a Democrat. But I think it's a litmus test in a more profound sense. And that is, if we are uh, talking about the historic sort of Protestant jurisprudential view of this question, then the, I think if you think, if you thought Roe versus Wade was perfect and needed no adjustment and was not flawed in some meaningful ways, then probably you would overly embrace the left-wing secular humanist view of life, right? If, if you don't see a problem with abortion being used in some places as effectively a form of birth control with no particular limitations, I think that shows an inadequate view of the value of life. But if you view this as a complete victory for life and health, then you probably don't take seriously enough the conundrums, the back alley abortions, the desperate women, the um, cases of rape and incest. We have absolutized sort of life at the expense of all other values, which, which the Bible itself doesn't do. 
And I think that that the, the true response to this is, wow, we're going perhaps from one extreme to another and people of thought and care and concern need to carve out a place where concerns on both sides can be thought through. I'll, ma I'll make a final point, and that is, I'm most concerned about some of the, the historical reasoning as a historian that was used in this case. You know, I think we should be guided by history, but in this instance, the court seems to suggest that we are going to be ruled by history, uh, no matter how tyrannical it is. We can't go beyond or past what those in the past believed were certain fundamental rights, and those must be somehow explicit in the Constitution. And in some ways, the nightmare of James Madison has come to pass. Of course, um, the lawyers amongst us will remember that James Madison was actually against the Bill of Rights to begin with because he felt that enumerating rights would create the impression that people's rights were limited to those rights. He was eventually persuaded that it was important to at least set down certain fundamental rights, but he was only willing to do so with the addition of the Ninth Amendment, which made explicit that the rights enumerated here should not be used to deny other rights held by the people. And this decision and the historical reasoning used uh, suggests that no, no rights, both either deeply explicitly in the text of the Constitution or held by a majority of the, of, of the country at the time uh, must be the standard and litmus test of whether a right exists. And if that is the case, we are in trouble with lots and lots and lots of our rights. And the majority of justices try to downplay this and say abortion is sui generis and Todd, I hope you're right and I hope they're right. But I think we see in Thomas's concurrence, there are those who are willing to overturn and this is the beginning of a series of dominoes. And it's, it's hard for me not to see the logic of that position and it concerns me greatly. Uh, there is a lot to comment on. Um, one, it's interesting that the same court who just yesterday ruled that states cannot, you know, legislate on gun rights, can legislate how people choose to um, make choices for their bodies. And there is a lot to be concerned with. I think that Todd mentioned that the concurrence is not an indicator for something more, but it's written in the majority opinion that rights that are not uh, deeply rooted in this country's history and tradition are essentially needing to be looked at again that are on the chopping block. And to be frank, and we all know this in this country's history, um, if you were not a heterosexual, cisgendered white man, your rights were not thought of in the Constitution or in you know subsequent federal laws. And so there isn't, it's not necessarily um, alarmist to be concerned about other due process rights uh, that have been given to us by the court and other federal laws. And that's just something to be concerned about at the outset. Um, it, was also, it was mentioned at some point as well that the impact of this case will be different depending on where you live. And while that's true immediately without any federal protections, that doesn't guarantee that other states will um, you know, repeal certain laws or, or il make illegal abortion. A lot of people today have mentioned California as if it's you know, a pinnacle place, but uh, it's not necessarily the case that that is a guaranteed thing. And I think some people in the comments have mentioned that not everyone has the ability to travel. So the people who are in states who don't have um, abortion protections, what are they going to do? Some people can't take off work. There, there are a lot of, of concerns to be around here. So some of, of the legal issues have been touched on already, but um, we should be able to think about this, not just as what its immediate impact is, but what its literal impact is, not just for abortion rights, but for things that are categorized as abortion. If someone has a miscarriage and they need to, you know, finish the miscarriage that is categorized as abortion. Um, we don't always have to think about abortion in the tragic sense of someone um, having, being, you know, impregnated in a tragic way. People have the right to choose when and if they are to have a family. And so this should be something that should be uh, concerning for everybody. I'll leave it there. 
I just want to say, I, I think you misconstrued what the second, what the Supreme Court's gun was. They did not say that states cannot regulate in the area of guns. They did strike down a particular statute about carry. But let's be careful in how we describe opinions. It was not a wholesale, you know, disregard for the state's ability to legislate in the area of guns. It was striking down the concealed carry. So it's a more limited site. I think we just need to be careful in how we describe those opinions. And yeah, and I understand that, but just, I will just so, go back going into LA, Ellen. Well, I'm, I'm glad that I get to um, kind of wrap up here and the segue with the gun decision, because it strikes me that one of the takeaways here is that this court is neither conservative nor pro-life because their decision allowing open carry of handguns clearly is going to lead to more death. So to, it's not a pro-life decision. Uh, moreover, the notion that making abortion illegal is somehow going to eliminate abortion is mythic uh, as a practical matter. Uh, so no, we don't have a conservative court a conservative court doesn't just throw out legal precedent that's been well established for 50 years. Um, the historic position of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as I understand it, is uh, fundamentally not in favor of abortion. We're very mainstream Protestant in terms of uh, thinking abortion is appropriate in very, very limited circumstances. And I'll, I'll leave it to the theologians to to, to maybe clarify that further. So, you know, criticizing the decision or seeing concerns uh, doesn't make us somehow pro-abortion. Uh, I think that needs to be clear. The historic understanding of the Religious Liberty Department uh, and my colleagues has been that the political movement to eliminate abortion is fundamentally led by Roman Catholics, rooted in Roman Catholic theology that the immortal soul enters the womb at the moment of conception. Now, I was taught something completely different when I came into the church about God breathing, uh, in, uh, forming man of the dust of the earth, breathing into him the breath of life, and man becoming a living soul. And as a matter of Protestant history, uh, Protestants, including Baptists and others, were not terribly concerned about Roe v. Wade when it was first handed down. They felt that, that the very restrictive abortion laws should be relaxed at that point. Uh, and it really has been uh, Roman Catholic leadership, which historically Seventh-day Adventists were very concerned, uh, based on insight from the writings of Ellen White, about Roman Catholic theology coming to dominate in American law. Uh, and and the, the, the other decision that, you know, is getting overlooked this week in, in light of the Dobbs case is the decision uh, requiring the state of Maine to include religious schools as eligible for government funding. Uh, and, and just a word on that, because I think it's, it's terribly important for context here. Uh, Tim started off by pointing out that this court prides itself, Alito especially, and prides himself on, on being a textualist and uh, respecting the original intent of the Constitution. The original intent of the Constitution was to deprive government of any ability to tax citizens to, to support the teaching of religion. That was absolutely fundamental in the, the founding generation and fundamental to the separation of church and state. And yet this court now says, not only uh, can the state be deprived of the authority to deprive religious schools of funding, under some circumstances, they're obligated to include religious schools in funding. Uh, for the first time, directly authorizing our tax dollars to pay for religious indoctrination. Uh, this is truly historic uh, repudiation of the First Amendment's prohibition on, on establishment of religion. So the hypocrisy, not only of, of 
uh, claiming to be pro-life, but claiming to be faithful to uh, the intent of the framers of our Constitution, it just, the, the hypocrisy seeps through the entire week of decisions. Um, you know, I was discussing the, the gun decision with a, a, a Jewish close friend of mine, and, and he reminded me that the Second Amendment says a well-regulated militia. So to, to deprive states of the right to regulate how guns are held and used is, is simply a uh, direct contradiction to the terms of the amendment. But, but this is what well, we Alan, get. I, I, thought, yeah, I thought this was a discussion, not on a Supreme Court roundup of things you don't like, but rather on the abortion. So I think we're getting a little far afield here. And again, I want to stress, the government is, states are still able to regulate guns. Again, that's not really what we're here to talk about. Also, the main decision, again, I think, again, I guess this has turned into just a roundup. It's important, I think, there to understand the context there where they were giving funding to schools and, and the Supreme Court just said you can't discriminate against religious schools. So, and, and that principle goes back to Zellman, Alan. This isn't a new thing. The point you're making was made 20 years ago in the Zellman decision about vouchers going to state schools. Essentially, it's a voucher decision in Maine. Parents make the decision. It's not going from the government to the schools absent uh, parental independent choice. Well, I, if, I, if I could just, just interject here, I, I wasn't gonna talk about, I wasn't gonna talk about uh, Carson versus Macon, but I, I'll say this about it. Uh, whatever the law allows, why in the world anyone who is part of a religious denomination would rejoice at this decision is beyond me. It seems to me that the church is not supposed to be funded by the state, but the church has a certain prophetic moral mission where it's supposed to stand over against the state to rebuke it when the state ends up doing the wrong thing. And the question I have is, how can that be possible if the church and its institutions are on the government payroll? You can't stand up and be a prophetic witness because essentially you're biting the hand that feeds you. So regardless of what the Supreme Court does, I'm astonished that any religious person who has any sort of moral or spiritual integrity would even want to partake in something that would compromise the power of its prophetic witness. That's all I have to say about that. But the students at your school get government funding, Tim. So you know the, the students at my school are uh, eighteen, typically eighteen and older. They are not subject to the same sort of religious doctrine doctrination that children are uh, are subjected to at the elementary school level. Nicholas, this is a different. This there are students who go to Wild Wild University who aren't even Adventists. You have to go yeah, to the same. How, how does that are Catholic? It's not about religious indoctrination once you get to the post secondary level, the way that it is in grades one through 12. It's a you very have, ball game with higher education. And again, I, I just I can't understand. I mean, your, your point is well taken, Nick. 20, 21 years ago in Zellman versus Simmons Harris, the court laid the foundation for this. They sort of reaffirmed it by essentially doing away with blame amendments in Espinoza versus the Montana Department of Revenue a couple of years ago. So, so the, the main decision, while it's not surprising, I, I'm struggling to figure out how any religious person who has any sense of spiritual integrity would want to compromise that by essentially being put on government assistance and thus being incapable in some sense of doing what God has called it to do. That's the moral and the spiritual point that I'm making. The legal stuff is what it is. But if we're going to have integrity, we have to maintain that integrity. And I think the way to do it is to absent ourselves from any sort of compromise. Well, the good thing about having this discussion is everybody gets to hear different perspectives. We are not trying to get people to feel one way or the other. 
but we did ask for a legal analysis, and I am not surprised whatsoever that the legal analysis carried over to the decision that was done yesterday with regards to guns. And it's well documented here again that people have different perspectives as it relates to that as well. I wanted to give um, Nia Langley an opportunity to finish her point, if she so desires, before we move on to the religious liberty implications. Um, I will just say as a young person who's studying for the bar, where um, one of the rights that we are studying that are guaranteed to us literally is the right to abortion. It's quite striking to see a court, um, members of the court, essentially ignore stare decisis and overturn 49 years of precedent with Roe v. Wade and then again, like we mentioned, with uh, with Casey. It's quite striking and it should not be lost on us are for this type of decision. Legal minds and other minds are concerned about what this means um, because of literally how the majority opinion is written. And so we should go into that. If we leave it legally and not just emotionally, it will still be very striking, not just for this opinion alone, but for the fact that a court can decide we'll just overturn nearly half a century of precedent. Thank you. Now let's talk about it from a religious liberty perspective. Um, Todd, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Alan and then um, we will go to um, Nick, and then we'll finish with Tim and Nia. Sure. You know, I think one of the things that has been very clear on this issue has been that people see this not really through a legal lens, but through their societal and political lens, right? It's amazing how people's polit how legal analysis just line up with their with what they think is just a good idea as far as from a policy perspective. And I think, you know, sort of the, I think the sort of hand wringing about that this could potentially have on religious liberty, I think, sort of falls in the same category. So I don't see significant challenges or threats to sort of our religious liberty jurisprudence from this decision. Um, unlike the right to abortion, the religious liberty rights is explicitly in the First Amendment. Um, it is right there. In fact, it's the first right listed. Um, and, you know, we have that balance with the Establishment Clause. I do think it's going to be interesting right now, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, it may be in the healthcare institution section, about will, you know, we've had up until this time, sort of up in the last maybe five years, sort of a detente on abortion, right, where it was legally protected, but government wasn't forced to pay for it, institutions weren't forced to do it, you have things, everything from the Hyde Amendment to the Church Amendments, and these whole raft of sort of protections, both individually and for institutions. Some of those are more enshrined in law than others, and it will be interesting to see if sort of moving forward there is a desire in certain states, especially those that are more progressive on this issue, to force institutions and healthcare providers to perform this against their conscience, saying that it's a form of dis discrimination. Uh, remember, in Title VII, there is a specific carve out that says that it's not sex discrimination, not to cover, uh, you know, abortion procedures and so forth. So I think it'll be interesting to see if we start seeing pressure in sort of places that are more pro-abortion or pro-abortion rights on individuals as far as a matter of conscience. Um, you're also going to get, I don't think it's going to succeed. I think the court will, at least in my view, have an easy way to get rid of it. You will have a certain number of individuals, and some have already tried this, though, to make an argument that they have a religious liberty affirmative right to an abortion. In other words, my religious right says that I must be allowed to, to have this abortion. Um, and I think, I mean, there's been a couple of cases I said so far. I don't think those have been particularly are going to go anywhere or very serious, but there will be sort of a more serious approach. I don't think that goes anywhere. And, you know, quite frankly, for, you know, one of the hypotheticals, I used to give a talk on religious liberty high school students at my old school every year. And one of the sort of the scenarios I think we all as attorneys have gone through, right, is on the limits of religious freedom. And the example, I mean, the prototypical example is, right, is human sacrifice. Like there are religions historically that believed in that infant sacrifice, other sacrifices, very much part of the religious rights and so forth. And people have always understood that government can ban that no matter how sincere or how integral. And so I think individuals that try to make this you know, sort of argument are going to run into that, that even if you do are able to make a religious 
a claim of religious liberty on this, that the interest in protecting fetal life is narrowly tailored and compelling. And we would obviously find that in other forms. Now, whether or not you think fetal life gets the same protection as non-fetal life, you know, that's kind of begging the question. But I think what the Supreme Court has said today is that is a state decision, not a federal one or not a U.S. constitutional one. So um, I do see those claims being made, and I don't see them going very far. And I would agree because we have essentially a Supreme Court that is profoundly influenced by Roman Catholic theology. Now, Christians and Protestants and Catholics both who don't see abortion as a religious freedom issue uh, have a problem with the fact that it's their religiously informed morality that is the status quo in the law, okay? You know, the, the court upheld a moral position, and many of the comments I'm reading, you know, it's a Christian moral view that says, well, the killing of the unborn is, you know, a form of murder, and it's immoral, and it should be uh, against the law. This is not a view that is shared by most of our Jewish uh, citizens, by most of our Muslim citizens. It's a uniquely Christian theological point, which Catholics have largely convinced Protestants of in the last generation or so. So to say, you know, regardless of what the courts do, ultimately with challenges that, that are being brought by, say, Jews and Muslims, because those challenges will come. The fact is, uh, it is restricting the religious freedom rights of religious minorities. It is a conscience issue. It is a religious freedom issue. And to say otherwise is, is simply to, to betray the fact that one comes from a very narrow cultural and religious viewpoint. I, I don't think that's a fair ad hominem attack on me. I mean, I think the people can have very different views on this, and I'm unaware of any religious organization or belief that says that you that you have to have an abortion. Now, there are, are certain groups, certainly not Orthodox Jewish, but others who, who don't have a problem with abortion, but that's different than saying that you are compelled to have one, that just like you have to go to mass or just like you have to go to Friday prayers or you have to, you're not exercising your right if you have an abortion. And those are two very different things. And to the best of my knowledge, there's no religion that I know of that compels people to have abortions as part of their right, even if they don't have an objection to it. More. Todd, you're very well aware that the law does not require a religious practice to be compulsory in order to be protected. Or even, even well, even again, it's not it's compulsory or even encouraged. You, it, it's just, it's allowed within certain faiths, but it's not, you know, when a person gets an abortion who's Muslim, I've never heard it expressed in such a way of, well, I have exercised my rights as a Muslim, right? Or I've exercised my rights as a, you know, pro, you know, reform Judaism. They, they, you know, in fact, it's almost always been put in terms of rights as a woman, right? And that's what it is. Um, and I think that's the best category that it goes in. So just for clarification, Todd, because I see some things in the chat. Um, from the church's standpoint, is abortion a religious liberty issue or not? So the answer to that is we have never in any statement explicitly said one way or another. We have also never argued it to the best of my knowledge is a religious liberty issue. We've never I, I joined an amicus brief on it claiming it was a religious liberty right. We've never taken a case on that. We've never made a statement that says that a person to have an abortion is part of their religious liberty rights. And I think there's a lot in leadership that would have a very big problem with that, right? You know, we just got done with a general conference session. And if that issue had been put on the floor, you know, I, I just, I mean, again, I'm not a prophet, but I just I think I know how that would turn out. Um, so, yeah, from the Adventist Church's perspective, we've never explicitly said it one way or the other, but we certainly have never said that the right to an abortion is a religious liberty right. It's always been, well, the church is just, you know, it has its abortion statement, right, that discourages it, that strongly, you know, strongly discourages it. And, of course, we changed that in 2019 to make it even more discouraged. Um, so, yeah, and, and we don't perform them. Again, I don't want to jump ahead of the hospitals but we you know, really don't perform in our hospitals except under very narrow circumstances. 
Was there a Mika's brief filed in 1988 as relates to the Webster case? Well, you're, I was 15 years old back then. Uh, and so I, um, I'm not sure. And the only reason I'm asking is this came from profile Andrew. And so I don't, I would not know that answer. So I yeah, I to. see that in the chat. Um, again, I'd have to go back. Um, and I did say to the best of my knowledge, um, mm -hmm. I'd have to go back and look, we certainly have not done it, you know, again, in modern history. Um, but I'd have to look up that case. But again, um, and I'd have to see what that brief even, what he, even that brief said. Fair. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, Nick? Yeah. Religious liberty implication. I know you were doing, I don't know if you heard the question, but wanted to make sure you got it. Yes. No, thank you. I did. And I think this question of how religion and religions uh, relate to the question of abortion I'm a little concerned about some of the history I've uh, heard set out. I think it's been a bit simplistic and in some instances just wrong. Um, it's as though uh, it, Catholics are the only ones that really have had a problem with abortion. And in the 1970s, Catholics persuaded Protestants to, uh, to come along for the ride. That's just not, that's just not historically accurate. Um, there has been a um, opposition to abortion in Protestant theology and practice and in the common law of, um, of England and the United States uh, that falls along the continuum, not entirely unlike the Road versus Wade, uh, Wade breakdown, but that, um, that there was a, a moment of, of quickening uh, under the common law, if you read um, Bracton and, and other uh, English common law jurists, um, and they were speaking within the Protestant natural law tradition, uh, there was a belief that abortion was wrong uh, at any stage, um, but if it occurred after quickening, where the fetus was uh, could, could be detected by the mother because of movement, and it's not entirely clear where that was, somewhere between eight and 20 weeks, uh, that after that point, that it was subject to the criminal law. And um, this was part of the common law and carried into the United States. And shortly after the time of the Civil War, you have uh, really abortion criminally outlawed in all uh, of the United States. First, it's about two thirds, but, but shortly after that, it's all of them. And so, it certainly wasn't the position of there can be no abortion at all. It's criminalized from the point of conception. Um, I, I do think that we need to acknowledge the theological influence there of a, of a Catholic kind of outlook. But, um, but, but just because Protestantism didn't embrace that particular position doesn't mean that it was perfectly content with embracing um, abortion historically, um, that's simply not the case. And many of our founders uh, spoke very strongly against abortion. I saw a quote in the chat from Uriah Smith that said abortion at any stage is murder. Well, Ellen White contributed to a, a book on issues relating to uh, sexuality and, um, and, and abortion she did not directly write on the question of abortion, but other people did and spoke very strongly against child murder and infanticide. And I think it's, uh, it, it, it's not correct uh, to suggest that Protestantism and Adventism have no legacy on being concerned about and opposed generally to abortion, although our position has never that I am aware of been absolute, and we've always been willing to protect the life and health of the mother. Uh, and I, I, I think those are important carve outs and caveats that many, that some on the right wing uh, evangelical side do not wish to acknowledge. And uh, we need to be clear on our more nuanced Protestant and Adventist legacy on these things. Thank you. Tim? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Woody. So here's, here's what I'd like to say about this as far as the religious liberty implications. Um, it is naive to suggest that a decision that does away with a 50-year precedent 
in the context of a personal choice that someone is freely able to make does not have implications for religious liberty, particularly when freedom is really at the core of the gospel, more fundamental to it than grace itself. For we benefit from grace, why? Because Christ freely and willingly gave himself up on the cross to save us. This is why we worship him. We worship God because he had all power in his hands and he consciously chose not to exercise it. So any government decree or Supreme Court decision that in any way eviscerates the freedom associated with individual decision-making is something that strikes at the very heart of the gospel itself. So I think the implications for religious liberty are far reaching with this decision. And I would also say that it's really time to do away with the straw men on both sides of this debate. I think if we're gonna be honest with ourselves, we can say that to say someone is pro-choice does not mean someone is pro-abortion. There is some nuance there. You can be pro-choice, but you can also oppose abortion with the hope that people will choose life. Here I'm thinking of a very simple scripture that says, God says, today I put before you life and death. Choose life. If somebody is taking death off the table, then they are playing games with my freedom. And Christ was God, but Christ was also fully human. And Christ exercised his freedom on my behalf. <clears throat> and it's because of that, excuse me, that I can avail myself of the grace of God. So we can't walk away from today's decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health pretending that it doesn't have any real implications for the gospel of Jesus Christ because it absolutely does. I would rather live in a world where abortion was lawful and people chose not to get one than to make all kinds of assumptions about how people live and say, oh, well, you could just go to another state or, oh, you could do this or you could do that. When those kinds of assumptions are unjustified, they're made from a certain position of privilege and a position in which people are of a certain ilk, socioeconomic ilk, are imposing their own standards on the standards of others. And that plus eviscerating the freedom of choice that is more fundamental to the gospel of Jesus Christ than grace itself is a serious theological problem that has far reaching implications for religious liberty. Thank you. You know, I, I go ahead, Alan, if you want to follow back up. Well, you know, I just want to put this in context because, again, the Adventist position has never been, you know, supportive of, of broad uh, abortion. We're, we're very restrictive in our moral views. Um, and, and that, I think, is shared by all of us. That's not the question. But from a religious liberty standpoint, you know, we have to understand the context that this comes in. We have a religious movement in this country that uh, really is intent on ruling in Christ's name. It is dominionist. It is, it's been called Christian nationalist or white Christian nationalist. And it's very much about male authority uh, being exercised uh, and exercising uh, based on uh, overtly religious values. And this is something that Ellen White had a lot to say about and that this type of movement is consistent with what we read in Revelation 13. So, you know, the abortion issue, the, as far as, should, you know, how the laws should be shaped uh, is, is, in some sense, a distraction from the larger issues and the great controversy, in my view. All right. Thank you. Nia? Um, I just wanted to echo what Tim was saying uh, about 
how this is, and many of us have already said it, that this does have religious liberty implications, and though some of us on the panel may think otherwise, um, when the draft opinion of this decision came out, um, however long ago, there were Jews and Muslims and many people who are of the Christian faith who interpret the Bible differently than, than some of us here may um, thought that this was an infringement of their religious rights. And it's hard to um, be one who thinks that you are able to engage in your freedom of association when this decision has largely been informed by a part of, of a group of Christians and Christian beliefs and not, you know, uh, informed by a non-religious viewpoint. And I'll just end um, succinctly saying what Tim was saying was that, you know, as a Christian, our God is a God of choice. And if we are not able, as all of us, you know, to allow others to make that choice, Christian or otherwise, then what are we doing here? I would like to thank our panelists who came to give a legal analysis on religious liberty. Um, this was um, great and outstanding. I appreciate the diversity, but not only the diversity, the willingness to engage in debate in a Christ-like manner. And so I want to thank Timothy Golden, who will be back with us in a later segment, Todd McFarland, who will stay with us as we go to the hospital and medical segment, um, Alan Reinach, I'm going to thank him, as well as Nick Miller. Hopefully we got you both out on time, so we respected your schedules. But no, once again, we will always invite you back to CJC today for your thoughts and analysis. And then last but not least, I would like to thank Nia Langley, recent graduate with her Juris Doctor degree from American University to ensure we have a broad perspective that includes millennials and so that their voice is heard in the church. And it's greatly appreciated. And we look forward to great things from you, Nia, as well. This time, as I release our guest, we're going to introduce Dr. Tiffany Clark Dillard, who is an OBGYN, I repeat an OBGYN, in Champaign, Illinois, and we're excited to have her here. She is a graduate of Andrews University, and she's my sister. She's also a member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha fraternity. I'm sorry, Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. Um, Tiffany, I want you to really give us the medical definition of abortion because there was some talk with regards to miscarriages. There was talk about the life of a mother. And if a medical thing is introduced, it's classified as an abortion. So can you kind of help us understand um, some of those things from a medical perspective? And once again, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So uh, from a medical perspective, um, we use the term abortion in different ways. The uh, abortion that is being discussed this evening um, is a voluntary interruption of pregnancy. So any pregnancy that is non-viable, we would consider an abortion. Um, so if someone has a miscarriage, that's co we consider that an abortion. And it's a matter of, you know, how the abortion is completed. Is it a spontaneous abortion? Is it induced? Um, did they start to miscarry and there's still some products that are left and they need a, you know, a surgical procedure to uh, complete it so it's an incomplete abortion? So as far as terminology, I would say that um, for this discussion, we're talking about a voluntary interruption of the pregnancy. Um, I hope that answers the, the question. I think it really does. Tell us about, um, as a doctor, when you're talking or when people are talking to those who are considering abortions, you know, the pros, the cons. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, these are life-altering decisions. You know, people have regrets or they have expressed regrets. Um, talk to us in terms of what goes into um, what doctors are saying or whether it's Planned Parenthood or Right to Life groups, you know, Everyone has a perspective. Um, talk to us about the pros and the cons in terms of um, the risk associated or the non-risk associated with abortion from a medical perspective. Okay. And that, once again, you know, there's, there's nothing that's simple about this whole discussion. That's, that's a very complex answer to you. But while well, I start out by saying, it, you know, in, um, in an exam room, 
when uh, a woman finds out that she is pregnant, of course, there can be a variety of responses. And, you know, I, I think many times folks feel that an abortion is some, a voluntary interruption of pregnancy is something that certain types of people tend to have more than other types of people. But really, really? They, women's of all backgrounds, um, all uh, races, there are women of all religions, there are women of all ages, socioeconomic statuses that will consider have an abortion. Um, so ranging from very young women who maybe had an unintended pregnancy, and actually that doesn't have to be a very young woman, that can be any woman. I have met women who are in their 40s who have um, become pregnant due to a you know failure of contraception um, or just due to the fact that maybe they thought they couldn't get pregnant anymore and pregnant. I'm sorry, I'm having a little camera issue here. Um, and it's caught them unawares. And so sometimes just depending on the life situation, um, a, an abortion or a voluntary interruption of pregnancy is something that women will consider. Um, it just depends on what their circumstances at the time. Some women will say, this just isn't the right time for me. I can't do it. I am, you know, I'm in a, a, a difficult relationship that I can't bring another child into. Or uh, I'm at a, a point in my life or career or demands or what have you. So there can be social reasons why ladies will consider having a termination. And then on the other hand, there are medical reasons why women will have a termination. Some people just are not healthy enough to carry a pregnancy. Or some women have had such complications with previous pregnancies that they are afraid to have another pregnancy. I very recently um, had a woman who had a very healthy pregnancy and hemorrhaged at the time of delivery. She is terrified. She is terrified at the prospect of getting pregnant again because she almost lost her life with the pregnancy that she just had. So sometimes there'll be women in that situation who just, um, who will feel that, uh, you know, they're not ready to carry a baby. And then there is a class of women who just strictly from a medical perspective, if they carry the pregnancy, we're letting them know that there's a very real chance that they're risking their life. Um, uh, so not just a maybe, kind of, you bled last time, you might bleed again this time. There's some people that just have medical conditions that they're just not healthy enough to do it. So there are some people who um, may have had certain transplants before. Or um, I can think of a woman who at her very first, it was quite tragic actually, but at her very first prenatal visit, with her initial blood work, she was diagnosed with leukemia. So in a way, the pregnancy saved her life because she had blood work done that diagnosed her with the leukemia. But then in another way, it was very tragic for her. Oh, I'm sorry. It was very tragic for her because she wanted this pregnancy desperately, but if she continued to carry it, she would surely lose her life. So it, 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 it's difficult. And so as a physician, we have to approach each case in an individual manner. And I think it's very important um, as a physician to leave our personal biases aside and really try to address the needs of the patient at hand. And then I can think of another category. Sometimes ladies will be pregnant and have a very, very much desired pregnancy and find that the baby has um, an anomaly that is incompatible with life or would um, make life for them very trying and difficult. And it's something that a parent would not want their child to go through. So these are some of the things that we are dealing with when we're talking about ladies who might be considering a termination. Um, so it, it's not just one thing, it can be many things. And so we have to meet the, the patient wherever they are and really help guide and talk them through a decision that's right for them. I appreciate that. Um, Todd, we've heard a lot of questions about um, Adventist hospitals doing abortions. You know, what is the truth with regards to Adventist hospitals and what are they doing um, as it relates to abortions so that we have a clear understanding 
of what's really happening at Adventist Hospital versus opinions and conjecture? So the first thing is Adventist hospitals are following the, the statements, both the 2019 and before, in position of the Adventist church. They are performing abortions, generally speaking, rarely. Uh, there's five different systems in, in the United States that, that, that we have. Um, and each of those systems has their own protocol and procedure uh, for an abortion. But the numbers are very low. There's been certain people who really like to protest the church and tried to describe the church as being an abortion factory in our hospitals, you know, for trying to display it as blood on the floor and so on. That just simply does not line up. Uh, the Adventist church, you know, hospitals will do abortions, you know, in the life of the case of life of a mother. Uh, that is always a given. I am not an expert on the exact protocol, but I believe they will also, under the circumstances of incompatible with human life, um, you know, but a purely elective abortion uh, in the sense that, you know, this is not a good time for me or I'm in a difficult relationship or the other things that Dr. Dillard mentioned, those would not be situations that they would, uh, they would do an abortion in. I would also say, just as a side note, and Dr. Diller, please feel free to correct me here on just the sort of medical community, but even if abortion did not have its moral sort of weight and so on, you would not find hospitals in today's sort of U.S. medical community where people would get abortions done, right? It's generally an outpatient procedure in a clinic, and just from a cost perspective, putting aside the moral issues, most people who are having elective abortion that doesn't have complications, isn't late term, et cetera, would choose to have it, you know, would have it outside in a, an offsite situation. But Adventist hospitals are very conservative in when they have abortions, but it's not a Catholic setting, right? We, 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 we will do that and protect the life of the mother and in other situations. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Um, most uh, you know, it's such a heavily debated topic that most, well, I, I shouldn't speak for, in that sense. I won't use sweeping generalities, but many institutions do not wish to get involved in the um, the ups and downs of, of, of pro-life, pro-choice. And just like um, you were mentioning, will say, well, if it's something that is involved for the life of the mother and, and beyond that, of the mother. Um, I know institutions that I have worked at in the past, if it was something related to the to um, either the life of the mother or uh, something in particular with the baby that was, was threatening life of the mother, would even choose to do it in an outside location if the mother was stable enough, as opposed to doing it within their organization. So if we know that we have one who is very early pregnant and they have a significant medical condition where they really should not carry this baby to term, then that's something that we would t tell them in advance and say, these are the places that you can get it done. It's typically done at a Planned Parenthood or at, you know, at an outside facility as opposed to inside a hospital, in inside a, you know, a, a major medical center. That's not typically where you'll find an abortion clinic. Um, that's more so for um, the rare exceptions where there's a patient who is hospitalized and cannot get out of the hospital and is sick and septic and something has to be done, that type of thing. So yes, I would agree with you. It's it's more commonly done in outside facilities as opposed to a major medical center. Um, Todd, there's a lot of chatter in the chat. Has, has this policy, you've mentioned 2018, 2019 with regards to the statements. What, what was happening before those statements were published? Was it not, was it different? Well, I mean, yeah, I'm wondering I, sure people you know, have a clear understanding what what's sure. going on here. So there are five different systems, and those systems, you know, all have slightly different approaches. But no, there was not a major switch in our institutions' uh, policy or practices. In fact, there may have been no changes, quite frankly, in some of them uh, when it came to abortion. We've always taken a conservative approach, very limited circumstances, life of the mother those kind of situations to do abortion with a lot of safeguards and procedures in place. I mean, a physician, even one with privileges, can't just do it. They got to go through various boards and committees, and that's always been the stance. So, you know, the 2019 reworking of the statement, it, it's not like we were doing a number of abortions before that and then reduced it. Um, and again, there's five different systems that all take a slightly different sort of process approach, though all of them are doing it in harmony with the church's stance, because these are, at the end of the day, seven Adventist institutions that support the work of the church. 
All right. Is there anything I missed um, that I didn't ask the question that can contribute to this discussion from our Adventist institutions or from a medical perspective? Because I think this was you know, very informative, very helpful with regards to chat. And the whole idea here is just give people the facts. I'm not trying to convince people one way or another, but you know, we have to humanize people that are actually doing it instead of doing it from a what I say a quantity perspective in terms of looking at it as numbers. There has to be a humanization, and you did that very well, Dr. Dillard. And um, uh, Esquire McFarland, I'm telling you, you did very well. Talking about the Adventist you know, position at these hospitals because people can say whatever they want on social media and what have you, and there's no way to fact check this thing, You know, whether we were just doing elective abortions in the 80s and then changed to 2018 or 19. We just don't have a place where we can actually get information. And that's what we were seeking for tonight. And want to thank both of you for providing it. But like, but like again, let me give you an opportunity for closing statements. Um, Todd, we'll start with yeah, you. I, the uh, one thing I wanted to say is I have fond memories of Dr. Dillard's uh, work environment. I am a University of Illinois Law School grad. So I remember Champaign for about three years. So I hope she enjoys living and working in the Midwest. But I enjoyed it then. And grew up just three hours west of there in Quincy. So that's my closing statement. <laughs> and yes, you, I, I'm living and working in the Midwest. Um, you know, what I would say is I, I feel that from a medical perspective, it's very important for a physician or a woman's physician or a, a, a person's physician to be able to step away from their personal opinion when it comes to these matters and to be able to share relevant information to the patient about what their true status is, um, what their options are. Um, I think that sometimes people feel uh, people can be, you know, heavily weighted on one side or the other side of the issue and may not be able to give reasonable options. So when women do find themselves in that situation, if it is from a medical perspective, they need to make sure they seek the advice of a board certified OBGYN or maternal fetal medicine specialist in regards to their true status, because, you know, we should be able to share information on percentages, likelihood, long-term risk, long-term outcome, you know, whether or not you continue a pregnancy. And then when it's not related to just medical risk, people should still be able to have reasonable information on what alternatives are there. And then beyond what the alternatives are, even, you know, once that decision is made, whether for or against, they need to be able to have um, reasonable access to contraception so they don't have to, to um, be in this position again. Although I say that with the disclaimer of knowing that there are many women who get pregnant of no fault of their own and it's not necessarily about contraception. So I'm gonna throw that in there. But for ladies who are in a situation because of a contraception failure or because what have you, they need to be able to have access to appropriate information so they can um, help make different choices for the people if they choose to do that. Once again, I'd like to thank our panelists for this medical segment, um, Dr. Tiffany Clark Dillard, and also our general conference attorney, Todd McFarland, um, for giving you the facts and the information, and you can make your own decisions as it relates to the hospital, Adventist hospitals and what they're doing, and as it relates to the medical advice that is given to women when it comes to pregnancy. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thank you for having me. Thanks. All right, now we're going to invite the uh, the last segment, but like I want to say, one of the best segments that we have, and I'm excited about the guests that we have coming on for this one. Uh, we have a homegirl in her own right who continues to establish herself. Every time I turn around, Claudia Allen is doing great things. I want to say great things. Um, whether it's ministry at the Emmanuel Brinkle Seventh-day Adventist Church, 
great things, whether it's her job with Howard County, great things, and whether it's her own website entrepreneur, writer, author, and international speaker, Claudia Allen continues to do great things, and she's a blessing to the body of Christ, and we're looking forward to her insights because you, you all, if anyone knows Claudia, she's always prepared, whether she's preaching, whether she's giving a tidbit, or she's coming on the show, Claudia is always prepared, and we're very fortunate that she's able to make it um, with us today and just thank her for here, being here. Uh, recognize Tim Golden, who's back for the segment. And then last but not least, Dr. Willie Hux. You know, we had to have a theologian in the house. We are not going to have this discussion as you saw the segments. We really wanted to talk about it from a justice and theological standpoint, because at the end of the day, God doesn't want any of us to perish, but for all of us to come to repentance. So as you listen to the different segments and, um, that is taking place tonight as you form your own opinions or you have more discussion as it relates to this topic, we invite you to consider what's being said and make a choice for yourself. We're not telling you which way to go, but we have provided outstanding panelists that will share their perspectives and opinions for you to consider. I regret to inform you, once again, I regret to inform you that Dr. Hemmings will not be able to join us tonight, um, but Dr. Olive Hemmings from um, Washington Adventist University, a professor of New Testament, will um, have to come back with us again. But one of the reasons why we did this show is we wanted to be relevant we want it to be timely as it relates to this broadcast because it just hit today and people want to know where we are from a legal analysis, a religious liberties perspective, a medical perspective, but a justice perspective and a theological perspective. And so I want to always end with the theology because I want you to go home with good theology and Dr. Huck is going to provide that. But I also want to hear it from a justice perspective. So we're going to ask Claudia Allen to go first, um, followed by Tim Golden, and then we'll end with the theological perspective by Dr. Willie Hux. All right, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Claudia Allen. Man, thank you so much, Woody, for having me. I'm grateful to be a part of this conversation. There's, There's been a lot that's been shared um, tonight. I think if we're going to talk about it from the justice perspective, what's kind of been percolating in my head this evening is that um, the conversation is really a debate between um, about human rights, right? Are we going to prioritize the human rights of the unborn child or prioritize the human rights of uh, the pregnant woman? Um, and so reproductive rights are what is uh, the challenge right now. And I think when you were talking about um, the religious liberty conversation, I think what's important for us to also recognize is that the First Amendment um, is a protection of religious freedom, right? And so that amendment declares that a person has the right uh, to exercise their religion according to the dictates of their own conscience, right? So that means that one does not have the right to legislate their own re religious exercise and impose that on someone else. So that what we're really seeing right now is it is a religious conversation, like, right? It is a moral argument. Um, and that is what the tension is. Dr. Miller explained that uh, very beautifully talking about that history. Um, and so I think that, you know, when we're really dealing with the root of um, abortion, let's not get into the weeds of whether or not this is a sin. We're having a conversation about whether or not it is legal, just, and right to determine what a woman gets to do with her body. And so at this point, I think what is important for us to walk away with is that I think we need to prioritize the human rights of the woman over the human rights of the unborn child. Now, I know that that is going to be extremely problematic for a lot of people. There's probably going to be a lot of pushback for some. I will never sit in this seat and declare to you that there's any evidence in scripture that permits abortion, right? 
there's enough scripture that talks about the fact that, you know, uh, God knew Jeremiah before he was formed in his mother's womb, right? That we have been anointed and appointed and set apart and chosen by God uh, prior to birth. And so there's plenty in scripture that, that, that supports the importance of being pro-life. But I think that Dr. Golden said it best um, during the legal segment that when we're really talking about this, we're talking about the fact that we serve a God that gives us choice. And so we would like most people, most women to be able to choose and decide to keep their children. But for all of the medical reasons that Dr. Dillard has so eloquently expressed, there are a myriad of reasons why women do not want to uh, carry a, a, a baby full term. And I think that it is a woman's choice, a woman's decision as to what she wants to do with anything that's happening on the inside of her. I think I, I heard it uh, on CNN earlier today. I loved the, the, the wording uh, of the, the, the crime, the scene of the crime is the womb. So that to even embark on any kind of jurisdiction inside a woman's womb, is such a breach of privacy. It is such an invasive place that it is truly inappropriate, um, unlawful, unconstitutional in my opinion. And I believe it is unethical to actually breach a woman's womb in an attempt to um, litigate a, a crime. And I think furthermore, what we're also seeing that's important when we're talking about um, human rights and justice, um, I think what's also important is that this is also, um, how shall I say, the criminalization of miscarriages is also a thing. So what people don't understand around the abortion conversation is that there are women who are in prison because they had a miscarriage, right? So there was a Native American woman, January of 2020, who actually miscarried and uh, spent four years in prison for manslaughter because of that miscarriage, right? She's not the only one. There are other women who have, and typically when those cases occur, uh, the assumption is that um, they either were on drugs or, or took drugs intentionally to kill the child, um, or there was some kind of involuntary death um, that was still in some way drug or alcohol related. Um, and so they then imprison these women because of that. That is also problematic, right? And so I think that what we're really wanting to talk about is human rights, it's reproductive rights, and it is acknowledging that women have the right to determine what happens to their bodies. And if that is in, if that is in um, conflict with their religious beliefs, then that is between them and their God but it is not up for, in my opinion, for any legal system to determine what a woman should be doing with her body. Happy to have my co-host here, um, Pastor Christian Josiah, who is the CJC Secretary and the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Director for the Central States Conference, as well as um, the Chief Operating Officer for the conference as well. Um, Pastor Josiah, we are talking about the justice aspects. We've heard from Claudia Allen. Oh. We'll go to Tim Golden. And then we're going to conclude with the theological implications with um, Dr. Willie Hux. Um, Tim, I mean, we see some things in the chat. You know, some of these things are just <laughs> are quite offensive. Therefore, you have not um, right. seen some of these things. That's um, right, being Woody. And well, the other you? thing. Not only are they quite offensive, let me finish real quick before okay. I go. Uh, we were never intended to talk about people or names. And I know that there's some been names and questions. Um, that was really, that's not the purpose of the show. I mean, the purpose of the show was to talk about the implications from a legal standpoint, a religious liberty standpoint, a medical standpoint, a justice standpoint, and a theological standpoint. Now, you are welcome to do your own show and do whatever you like, but that's not who we are as the Conscious and Justice Council. 
We believe in the biblical foundations of conscious injustice and sharing that information through our panels so that people can make a, an informed decision as relates to whether they agree or disagree with the overturning of Roe versus Wade and the implications that have been raised by our expert panelists who donated their time, their experience and their expertise to be a part of this discussion. So we stand by that. We appreciate those of you um, who uh, who have chatted in the count and the uh, who have placed comments in the chat constructively, um, but we're not going back and forth about this issue versus that issue. We're providing you with some information for the panelists so you can agree to agree or agree to disagree. But we will not be engaging in a debate with you as a part of this broadcast. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn this. Um, facilitation part over to Pastor Josiah as we um, go to Tim Golden in his remarks. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it directly to, to to Tim. Sorry that I was late. I was literally doing a Bible study, y'all. You know, there's some people out here actually. <laughs> some some pastors and preachers actually still do Bible studies. But anyway, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm just I, I came in listening to Claudia, man, and I'm just um, I'm just saddened and um, I want to say discouraged. Uh, but also encouraged because I know, as I, I matter of fact, my Bible study was on uh, Revelation and the millennium. Um, this reminds me that Revelation 12 and 13 and 14, uh, where there is a coercion of the will and the conscience, is going to happen before Jesus comes. I mean, it's, it's, it is sad. You know, I have a, I have a, a wife and, and three girls, got a lot, got a lot of girls. Uh, power around me, you know, and it is shocking and it's sad, but you know, we just gotta, we just gotta buckle up because, um, I believe that this is, this is going to be the beginning, uh, or the continuation of the erosion of the conscience from, from a, from a different angle than we maybe assumed as Christians and as seventh day Adventists, um, it's, it's, it's going to come from within. Um, and and it's something that we should not be be overly shocked at. But I want to I want to I want Tim to uh, Attorney Tim to go ahead, man, and Professor go ahead, man, to share. All right, thank you so much, uh, Pastor Josiah, and again, thank you, Woody, for assembling this panel. You know, I, I just want to say a word or two about the structure of this program tonight. It's fascinating to me that we've had to separate the legal aspects of today's decision from the justice aspects of today's decision. The law and justice are not one and the same. And so as Christians, we are called to go above and beyond what the law requires of us. Now I get to talk bad about lawyers because I happen to be one. There's a reason why Jesus said, woe to the lawyers and called them hypocrites. Why? because they became so concerned about the letter of the law. Jesus put it this way, you tie the mint and cumin, but you neglect the weightier matters of the law, right? Judgment or justice and mercy and integrity and things of that nature. So I, I, I really wish that this segment had been the majority of tonight's conversation uh -huh. because uh -huh. the most important part of all of this is the moral aspect of it. And I just wanna put myself in the shoes of of Amos, for example, or one of the one of the one of the minor prophets, or one of the major prophets, for that matter, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and when they looked out in their society, what they saw was a bunch of people who have been marginalized. I'm thinking today how we sit here as lawyers and as everybody's got a theory about whether abortion should be legal. Meanwhile there are young women who are living in states where maybe they're victims of sex trafficking and they've got pregnant. Maybe they've been raped and they've got pregnant. Maybe they just made a bad choice and they got pregnant. And we are completely overlooking the stories and the individuals and the people behind these theories that everybody has about abortion. It sort of reminds me of the man born blind in John chapter nine. When the disciples saw him, they just reduced him to 
a walking billboard for the latest theory about why he was born blind. But when Jesus saw him, the scripture says that Jesus saw a man. And I'm wondering when we're going to get to the point from a justice standpoint that we're going to see people as people and then consider those people, those young women who are victims of sexual violence, or maybe they're just victims of poverty. Maybe they're victims of a world in which their voices are, are unheard and they find themselves in these difficult situations and they're not able to go online and purchase a plane ticket and go to another state and, and, and get an abortion. They're not able to really make the best decisions for them. And today's Supreme Court decision took that away from them. That's where the moral outrage should come. I'm not talking about what's lawful. I'm talking about what's right. And as Christians, we ought to be less interested in the law and more interested in what is just. Micah 6, 8 sums it all up. He has shown thee, O oh man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to what? Do justly, love mercy, not just love to love to receive it. We all love to receive mercy, mm -hmm. but love to give it. Where's our compassion? Where's our sense of, of being able to put away our high and mighty theories about abortion long enough to be able to see people as yeah. human beings? That could be your mother, that could be your sister, that could be your niece, right? We have to be able to see people as human beings. I saw somebody put in the, in the text, waiting for Bible verses. Go read John chapter nine, one through three, and look at the difference between the way Christ approached the man born blind and the way the disciples approached the man born blind, and then apply that to our current conversation about abortion in light of today's decision. Everybody's got a theory about what these, what young women do wrong. Everybody can talk about why well, you shouldn't be out there having sex in the first place. Everybody's got a theory, but nobody is able to suspend their theorizing long enough to recognize the humanity in people. It's like the people who saw the man born blind walked around more blind than he was because mm. their eyes were wide shut to his humanity okay. and shame on us you want another bible verse shame on us for failing to see the savior in the face of a scared young woman who is facing a life-changing decision and has no way to make it and tell me she is not part of the least of these in matthew 25. Mm -hmm. so you want bible verses i can give them to you all day and all night shame oh. on us for not recognizing people as human beings, what they're going through long enough to get up off, our, off of our theoretical high horses and see them for who they are, not for who we think them to be. Mm, mm -hmm. mm, mm. The moral, the moral, the moral high ground, man. The morals uh, superseding the legal, seeing people as God's children. Um, mm -hmm. and not just the letter of the law. I mean, you dropped a few verses, man, but we've got a whole, we've got a whole new Testament, uh, where Jesus actually did what you, uh, shared. Uh, we're going to go to Dr. Dr. Hux, man, go ahead and share with us at this time, um, your perspective, um, your nuggets of truth. Thank you, pastor for, uh, allowing me this time to speak and thank you also, Woody, uh, for this opportunity. When, Woody, you introduced me as a theologian, I think you did an injustice to everyone else uh, on this panel because I knew, for starters, that I wouldn't have much that I would need to say in terms of the theology once I knew that Tim was going to be speaking before me. So I do want to thank uh, both of my colleagues during this section for all of the wisdom uh, that they have dropped on us. Uh, I, I do want to start by saying that my uh, areas of focus as it relates to theology lie within the realm of pastoral theology. And, and I say that for this reason, not only is pastoral theology valid, I found that in all of my years of ministry, 
that's where I did the best theology, mm. not in the classroom, but actually in congregational ministry. That's where I came to my best personal, practical, theological understanding of who God is and what his will is for me and for others as well, for, for his people. Having said that, if, if I could attempt to start by putting this within a theological, a so-called theological context, uh, one of my favorite Bible books is the first book of the Bible, Genesis. I've often said that if I did not, I would have the full gospel right there in the book of Genesis. I won't try to explain everything that I mean by that, but for the sake of this conversation, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is as messy as it sounds and as messy as it seems, and this has already been said throughout this program this evening, God, for some reason, chose to give us freedom of choice. It's a messy prospect. It leads to great decisions. Mm -hmm. It leads to not so great decisions. And I could call names all night, but it started with Eve and Adam. It went all the way through the rest of the book uh, to, to Joseph's brothers. Uh, God chose to give them freedom of choice. Um, they exercised. Uh, their decisions. And, you know, there's some in Genesis who did well, some who did not. Mm -hmm. For the sake of this conversation, we have to understand that as difficult as it seems, as we are addressing this topic of abortion, it this is not black and white. This is not easy. This is not simple. We cannot make it simplistic. And I thank Dr. Dillard, who I think she just hit a home run tonight. Absolutely. Uh, with everything that she shared and the way that she laid it out for us, it to me could not have been any clearer. It could not have been more clearly said than the way that she said it. And I applaud her yeah. and I thank her for everything that she said. Uh, having said that, you know, as somewhat of a theological foundation, I'd like to uh, sort of veer from that for the rest of what I'd like to talk about. And as a pastoral theologian, I'm always looking at the ramifications of our theological expression. How do these things play out in real life? How do you define your terms? What do these things look like? And I don't want to so much focus on abortion because I think that that is, while this is a topic, everything that we have looked at over these last two months since the draft uh, was uh, first leaped all the way through the decision today on uh, Roe v. Wade. Uh, all of these things from a theological perspective are not really my focus. I'm concerned about the inconsistencies that we can uh, enunciate, the inconsistencies that we can practice and I'll give you three examples if, if I could sort of put them into three different categories. Uh, and let me start by telling this story that we all remember. If we would go back to 2020, where there were a lot of race discussions in our country, and you'll understand why I'm bringing this bringing this up here. Um, our uh, our approach within Christianity and the approach among some Adventists, dare I say, that I know, uh, have differed as it relates to, say, race and abortion. This is what I mean uh, by that. In 2020, in conversations that I had with so many people about race, they would say, well, racism is something that we have always experienced. We can't do anything about that. We can't change it. It's a matter of the heart. God has to work on the heart. But these same individuals, as I talk to them, they cheer loudly when it comes to the decisions of the court um, that, that were made today. And to me, there's a certain inconsistency uh, mm -hmm. that, that runs through all of this. And, and before we think that this is something new, I go back 40 something years when I was in high school, the conversations that we used to have, and this was a public school, by the way, I graduated from a public school. 
uh, the conversations that we would have in the cafeteria and the hallways, uh, a small group of us would be along the lines of how people would say, old schools haven't been the same since they took God out of the schools. Society hasn't been the same since they took God out of this and, and God out of that. Well, this has always been uh, a reality, but the one thing that that never stopped me from doing was exercising my faith as I understood it uh, during those times. So I, I, I say that to say um, that you know, we, you know, we can be true to the God that we love and the God that we serve uh, and, and be consistent in our approaches concerning all these things. The, the second thing that I wanna get to is uh, an inconsistency with our use of uh, not only the Bible, but Ellen White. Uh, also back in 2020, uh, the, it seems to me that the quote of the day, and I had to grab uh, the copy of the book so that I could read it and not misquote it, um, Desire of Ages. Uh, this is from page 509, Desire of Ages, page 509. This is, a, this is a comment that I heard so often during the race discussions. And, and this is uh, going down uh, on the page and I'm skipping through part of this. Um, he who was our example kept aloof from, er from earthly governments, not because he was indifferent to the woes of men, but because the remedy did not lie in merely human and external measures. To be efficient, the cure must reach men individually and must regenerate the heart. I found it interesting that they always focused on that paragraph, yet on the very same page is found this paragraph. And I'll read just a part of this paragraph. I've given you the reference. You can take a look at it uh, for yourself. Um, uh, but they desire to make our Lord the ruler of the kingdoms of this world, the ruler in its courts and camps, its legislative halls, its palaces and marketplaces. They expect him to rule through legal enactment, enactments enforced by human authority. Since Christ is not now here in person, they themselves will undertake to act in his stead to execute the laws of his kingdom. The struggle that I always had when these discussions took place a couple of years ago is, on one hand, you say that these issues have to be cured by God working on the heart. But then you turn around and you want to go to the legal system. Huh. You want to go to the legislature. You want states to make these decisions. You want the Supreme Court to make the, these decisions. And to me, there is an inconsistency that has to be addressed. Which way do you want it? Do you want God to work it out? Or do you want the legal system uh, to work it out? Uh, the last thing that I will bring up here is, uh, as one who teaches classes on the intersection of church and society, as well as homiletics, uh, I, I always like to look at how uh, church, society, and homiletics uh, blend, how they mix, how they mesh with each other. And in my advanced preaching class, my seminar and preaching class, one of the sermons that my seminarians have to preach is what is referred to as a prophetic sermon. Now, I think there are many of us who are a part of this conversation who understand that when I say prophetic preaching, I'm not talking about preaching Daniel and Revelation. Uh, I'm talking about much of what Tim was talking about, you know, talking about what does Amos have to say? Um, you know, speaking and preaching in the spirit and power of Elijah. And one of the things that I have discovered is there are some who are very adept at understanding and grasping uh, the direction that prophetic preaching goes from a biblical perspective. But those who struggle, struggle from this main perspective, and that is when they attempt to preach, they fall into the trap of reading the Bible and speaking about the Bible through political lens and not a biblical lens. Oh. The problem in going down that road, as I have discovered, when they struggle with this is uh, often their preaching is not people-based. 
it ends up being um, politically based and people get lost in the equation. If our preaching prophetically or preaching otherwise does not focus on people where they are and where God wishes to find them and bring them from where they are to where God wants them to be, then we're in trouble. Hmm. So, so I don't look at this conversation merely from the abortion perspective. I look at this conversation from the perspective of if we don't see this from the perspective of people and where they are, then we're going to miss the boat in terms of their spirituality. We're going to miss the boat in terms of uh, helping them to understand uh, that God sees them and their trauma and their life setting and their life circumstances where they are uh, and loves them in any and every setting and in every situation. Claudia, you look like you're about to say something. I saw, I saw that, I saw that finger go like this. No, no, no. I, <clears throat> no, not at all. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm thinking. Um, you talked about God and the heart, uh, Dr. Hux, and um, those who may, may, may lean towards the courts and the legal system, uh, being the same people who verbalize. Uh, that 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 you know they hold up the Bible and they hold up, you know, um, they talk about God. Um, do is it that Christianity in our day um, doesn't recognize when when something may be maybe a moral issue, um, or they just choose? Uh, I'm just I'm just wondering. Are 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 people naive? They 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 don't see it. I don't. My, one of my daughters. I'm not gonna say which one. But one of them some time ago said um, when there was, you know, I guess it was a presidential election and, and, and they were talking about pro-life and pro-guns and, um, and they were shocked uh, that a certain party was pro-life. They were like, well, what, what? You know, because they say, well, they, they seem to, to not have a problem when, when black people die and, you know, they seem to not have a problem when animals die Matter of fact, they hunt, you know, I, you know, for those of us who eat curry go or, or used to, I'm vegetarian <laughs> now, you know, they, they, don't, they don't just hunt for food. They like, like have no problem killing, you know? So, 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 so she was shocked that this same group that had no prop, they didn't, they didn't particularly stand up for, you know, minorities lives who are impacted or whether it be Black Lives Matter or uh, in, immigration issues that they, they didn't have a problem with uh, babies dying at the border, no problem with animals dying for fun. You know, they love to hunt. She was just like in amazement that, oh, I thought the pro, pro-life, pro that, that doesn't make sense. So is, is there some kind of a, is it, is it, is it a mental block or, or you can possibly I don't know. Just, just just help us out on that. I can't. I can't speak to the mental block. Uh, my girl Tiffany Llewellyn is in the comments. You know, she's the psychologist. She might oh, be able God. to speak to that. I, to, yeah. I don't know if there's a psychological thing, but if I'm if I'm quite honest, I I, I think it's very clear that the right is not pro life. The right is pro the control of women's bodies. And so this is constantly from the very beginning, always been about controlling what a woman gets to do and what a woman does not get to do. And so whenever we're talking about reproductive rights, whether we're talking about the pink tax, right? The fact that uh, feminine items are taxed at, 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 at higher rates, right? Whether we're talking about the fact that um, uh, Viagra, there, there, there's, there's, there is a, a you know, prescription drugs to to aid in 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 male uh you know ver veracity and there is not one for women right or the the fact that um it, how long did it take for there to become uh, birth control for women right i mean like oh. there there oh. has always been um oh. a culture and a system around what women get to do 
and particularly in the church. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily want to go down this road, but I mean, even if we think about what women wear, <laughs> what women get to wear when they come to church, what women don't get to wear, right? So I, I think that when we're we're talking about abortion, we are we're, we're talking about reproductive rights. We are talking about what women get to do and what women don't get to do. And we have a host of men who oh. are in legislative positions making decisions about women's health, and I just find that extremely problematic. Like full, oh. like full stop. There's there's nothing else oh. to talk about. Like men have never been in childbirth, will never be in childbirth, and so. I don't think that you are informed enough to determine whether or not what a woman is doing um, during an abortion is is murder or not, particularly when you talk to women who have had abortions and many of them have to actually go to grief counseling and a myriad of other um, services because they actually are aware of the fact that they're killing a life that is inside of them. No one is is choosing to do this and excited. No one is just just killing babies, right? I, I've been seeing things in the comments uh -huh. uh, almost like women are whores and they're just running around sleeping around just um, on the whim, getting pregnant and then having abortion after abortion after abortion. That is not the case, okay? And so whenever we're talking about this, I just feel like the one thing I want to say, and I'm not as eloquent, I'm sick, there's a lot going on, but Tim will say it more eloquently than me. The only thing I'm here to say on this panel is that this is about controlling women. And the moment that we can get to a place where we can allow women to be in control of their own lives, allow women to have the agency to determine what happens to them, that is when we will see justice. Wow. Well, you know, uh, Pastor, if, if I could just, you know, come in here and thank you, Claudia, for, wow. for that wonderful articulation that you just gave. You know, they, we have to get away from this. We have to do some do some work and distinguish between politics with a lowercase p that refers to ideology of political parties, Democrat or Republican. The church should always strive to stay away from that, uh -huh. right? But there is also the political with a capital P. From Genesis to Revelation, the political is present in Scripture. What uh -huh. do I mean? When we talk about the political, we're talking about a community of persons organized under an authority that has the ability to make law, don't eat from that tree and enforce it. The day you eat from it, you're going to die. And so from Genesis to Revelation, we have a community of persons, Adam and Eve, organized under this authority, God, and the political with a capital P is unavoidable. You can't even speak of the king of the kingdom of God without invoking the political. A kingdom is necessarily a type of political arrangement and organization. And so if we could get away from ideology long enough to see that in scripture, again, from Genesis to Revelation, God is profoundly concerned with how people are treated in the political realm. And when people are overlooked, when the dignity of persons, as Claudia spoke a moment ago, when a person's agency, when a person's autonomy is completely trampled underfoot, when the political has deteriorated into a system or scheme of oppression in which certain people are made to succeed and others are made to fail. This is the call of the Christian. It is the call to justice in the realm of the political. There's a difference between the politics, or I'm sorry, between the political imp uh, impulse of Dr. King and the political impulse of focus on the family. There is a difference. There is a sense in which one is committed to a rank political ideology that, as Dr. Hux told us, sees the Bible through an ideological lens with no integrity 
And the other is coming from the standpoint of a Christian who looks at the ethics of the society in which he or she is living and says, this is fundamentally wrong. This is wrong. Something has to change. And so once we make that distinction between politics, small p, and the political, large p, or uppercase p, then we can start to get some sense of the moral obligations that we have as Christians to do what the scripture says, which is cry aloud and spare not. Until we make that distinction, we're going to be running around being as dishonest as we can, just sitting on the sidelines, criticizing without really making any meaningful headway toward loving God and toward loving God as seen in the face of our neighbor. So, so let, let me ask, man, how, to, to all three of you, how, how I mean, I kind of kind of know the answer, but how do we help people to, to have a spirit of compassion for, 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 for all those who, 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 who struggle, who are marginalized? How, how as, as you know, a little child to lead them, how does a, a, my little girl see, hey, I don't want to treat these animals you know, wrong. I, Dad, how, how can people take a gun? You know, uh, it was just confusing, you know, and, and, and kill, but, but, you know, or even you, dad, you know, as, as, as an African-American male, you know, when I, when I'm rolling with my Lakers gear and, you know, you know, I, I feel sometimes like I'm a target, you draw, drive through certain places. How, how do, how, how does the same compassion some say they have for the unborn how do we help them to have the same compassion for all of god's children who are born how 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 do we you know i, I mean i i know i know the holy spirit has to be the one to, but is there anything that we can do is there anything we can do to help people see the 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 hypocrisy i mean it's just blatant hypocrisy of of saying that you are pro-life and saying that you care for, for, for someone that can't defend themselves why you seemingly not care for others in, in the same way. How, how, how do we help our, our friends and our neighbors get there? Uh, excuse me, I'm interrupting here, interjecting here, not because I have to talk, but because I have to be on another call in about That's all right. five That's all right. minutes. Go so ahead. pastor, I want to thank you so much. And my thanks again to, to Woody for this forum. Uh, uh, sure. Dr. Hux, it was so good to see you, and Woody, good to see you. Claudia, man, it's been too long. Uh, too long. Thank you too long. so much, and it's great to see you, and uh, mm -hmm. blessings to everyone in the comments. Uh, whether you like what I had to say or not, uh, Jesus loves you, and so do I. So uh, <laughs> God, God bless <laughs> everyone, and have a great Sabbath, and uh, thank you again so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Tim. Yes. Thank you, man. As always, every good thing must come to an end. Wait, um, wait, wait, had, wait, wait, hold on. We've had some great um, conversation. And I know uh, Christian has another question, so we'll make sure we have that. But um, I just want to reiterate, folk, um, you know, Conscience and Justice Council does not shy away from the subjects or the conversations. But, you know, the, some of the things that are coming up in the chat is just, you know, they're just rhetoric. I mean, they have no basis for what we're trying to do with regards to the show, but we're glad that you decided to troll us, and we hope that you share more information about us. And matter of fact, we want to invite you to come to our Conscience and Justice Council convention, and I'm just going to take the opportunity to share that so that you can save the date, and we're going to be talking about prophetic justice, September 22 to 25, 2022 in Glendale, California. You'll see more information. Registration will open up next week on our website at www.cjcouncil.org. Um, Christian and I will talk about this later, but we want you to know about that. Um, we appreciate, you know, whether you like us, love us, disagree with us, or how the show we have nothing but love for you. As Amen. a Justice Council, 
We oh. are mandated to follow the biblical principles for conscience and justice as outlined in the Bible. Um, I am a little disappointed in some of the comments, to be honest with you, in the name calling and some of the things that have taken place. This was not the purpose of this conversation. Once we said we talked about implications from a legal standpoint, a religious liberty standpoint, a medical standpoint, a justice standpoint, and the theological standpoint. Why do we do this? Because we know the conversations aren't going to be had because they're going to be deemed political. And there's not a space for our young people as well as our older people to have this type of discussion. So you can form your own opinion. We're not forming an opinion for you. You're forming your own opinion. We did not poll the panel to see who was pro-life or pro-choice. We asked them to come on and share their expertise and experience as it relates to the legal analysis, the religious liberty implications, the medical implications, the justice implications, and the theological implications. Scripture has been used and continues to be used. You can go back and look at this program again, so that you can watch the scriptures that were used with regards to the position. Once again, we're not proof texting, but we're providing the implications and you have the right to agree or disagree and we can move on. But we hope as a result of this, you will come back to more of our Conscious and Justice Council um, informational sessions that we will have. We will not hide away from any conscience and justice issue because we believe that the public affairs and religious liberty ministry is the most underutilized ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And far too long, it has been limited to Liberty Magazine campaign, which I support and hope everyone gets the subscription. Um, where's my Sabbath accommodation letter? and trolling legislation and court decisions, mainly as it relates to Sunday blue laws. We have an evangelistic opportunity by following ministry of healing in terms of Christ's method of evangelism as outlined in the gospel as well. And we're the practical thing that we need to do. As you, for those of you that know, we have a lot to do so that we can better connect with our communities and having these discussions um, provides an opportunity for us to consider our positions and decide whether or not the principle of God will rule our lives or our partisan politics. For me, I decide the principles of God. For you, that's your decision that you have to make. Some of us are so partisan that we can't even relate to the principles of God and how we interact with others, especially as it relates to these contentious issues where we may have a difference of opinion. So my prayer for you, my prayer for me, is that we will allow the Holy Spirit to rest, rule, and abide in us so that the decisions that we make, not only can we own them, but that when our judgment day comes before God, we will stand before him and he will acknowledge us, acknowledge us as one of his own. Um, Dr. Hux, you know, you, you gave a lot of information and um, people, you know, the Bible text and this and that. But at the end of the day, it really comes to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And if you could just give us some feedback on that, then I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Josiah to close it up in his comments. But if you can really talk about the Holy Spirit, because... Um, at the end of the day, that's where the conviction comes from. Uh, it, uh, thank you for that question. If I could attempt to combine a response to that question with what Pastor Please. Josiah asked earlier, I'd like to yeah. uh, share a brief story of my pastoral ministry days in New Orleans throughout the 1990s. Everyone was concerned about hurricanes uh, in New Orleans, but what I discovered sometimes the tropical storms carried as much of a pop uh, as some of the hurricanes did coming that way. And in the house where my wife and at that time small children lived, we were near a creek. Uh, there, there, was a, there was a small creek just a couple of blocks away. And when those pinwheels uh, around the low pressure system would just come in, we'd get a lot of rain and then some calm, rain and calm, rain and calm. The water would rise, the water would go back down. The water would rise, it would come out of the creek, it would come up the street, come into 
uh, come up onto our property, but never into the house. Uh, but one thing that I would always say is, when will this ever come to an end? Um, you know, it, it was just a constant um, flow of water that came. And I use that story to indicate this. Uh, when it comes to, uh, and I believe, Pastor, your question was along the lines of how to uh, develop compassion. Uh -huh. What we have to understand is it is not an e uh, uh, it is not an event. It's a process, and it takes time. Um, and in my approach, whether it is through words spoken or deeds done or prayers prayed, I get into it. I never let it go. I'm tenacious. I go after the target until I achieve what it is that I want to. Uh, now, and I'll use this example um, to, to come back to, um, to, to Elder Woods and his question. I have a neighbor uh, down the street who um, is proud of his um, Confederate heritage. Uh, I won't get into the details, but he's very proud of it. That never has stopped my wife and me from walking past his house. And when he's out in the yard doing yard work, we're going to speak. We're going to wave. Uh, we're going to communicate in whatever way we feel needs to. For six years, we've been doing this. And within the last couple of years, he's gotten to the point where he will actually not smile, but speak uh, to us. To me, that's progress. Huh. Uh, to me, we're going in the right direction. How long is it going to take to break through? I'm not quite sure, but that's not really my concern. Uh, my concern is to listen to the voice of God um, and to do what he tells me to do, no matter how long it takes me to do uh, what it is. So, yes, prayer is at the foundation, um, but, but activity and action, consistent action um, without becoming, without growing weary and well-doing is part and parcel of what needs to take place. I hope I've addressed both of those questions in, in, in that suit. Absolutely. You have. You have. Claudia, you wanna you wanna weigh in on yeah. So I, I I think what's coming to my mind in terms of practicality for people mm -hmm. um is how can we uh love the people that we are uh currently frustrated with, right? We're frustrated with women for having abortions. And um, I think that Nia put it in the chat a little bit earlier, um, but people that don't know, there actually is no formula on the shelves, right? There hasn't been formula on the shelves for a few weeks. Um, there's been a shortage, an outage in the grocery stores. Um, but even beyond that, I think that our society at large is not pro-life. There are systems and structures in place that ensure that uh, from the time a, a child enters kindergarten uh, through their uh, high school graduation, if they make it, they are destined to more than likely experience poverty, um, uh, food deserts and food insecurity, um, a lack of access to health care, lack of access to a college education, lack, lack of access to the internet. Um, so the quality of life that we are demanding that person's experience is very fascinating to me. And I think that what one of the things that we should um, commit ourselves to doing is ensuring as a church, um, as persons who advocate for justice, we need to ensure that people's quality of life is one that makes them want to live, one that makes them want to procreate. And if we can, as a church, uh, provide services, partner with local organizations, even partner with some of our government entities in ensuring that people's life experience is one that actually promotes that of dignity and humanity, um, if we can then embrace women who are experiencing um, the difficulties of pregnancy and the, uh, in the ways that Dr. Uh, Tiffany Dillard explained uh, during our medical segment, um, if we can actually uh, come around and just love people, you know, and, and allow people to make the choices and decisions that they believe that are truly and genuinely best for them, fully speaking, 
Um, whether that woman is experiencing some kind of a life-threatening um, disease or condition that does not allow her to bring up a pregnancy to full term, or if we're just talking about a woman that just simply doesn't want to have kids, right? Like th there's a lot of things that happen, um, a lot of reasons why a woman doesn't want to give birth. And I guess, that, you know, my heart uh, for my church, for every single person on here listening, is for us to open our hearts and to just love people and to uh, not engage in that invasive practice of, of infringing upon a woman's womb, uh, but rather truly giving her the space to walk and breathe and live and determine what happens to her. Um, and instead to love her with the love of Jesus Christ, knowing that as Dr. Golden said before, we can be pro-life and still be pro-choice. Uh, this is not black and white, but this is something um, that we can do as a whole and uh, that's truly my prayer for everybody. Amen. 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 Well said. And I think it's a it's, it's a great way to wrap up, man. You know, having the compassion of Jesus Christ, I believe if 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 we could all pray for it, if we could all seek God on it, you know, we we believe, you know, that the Holy Spirit is available and willing. You know, we we we, we preach it, we teach it. You know, He says, "I'm willing to give." The Holy Spirit even more than uh, parents are willing to give good gifts to their kids, and mm -hmm. He is the one that 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 uh, Freddie Russell preached a sermon at our camp meeting. You know, the fire comes before you go forward. You know, you can't move forward. You can't you can't manufacture compassion, as, as Dr. Hux alluded to. It has to come from the heart, and when it comes from the heart, uh, as I think Dr. Nixon just shared, it supersedes what the Holy Spirit does. Supersedes law. Uh, and and anything that man man can do, and, and and hopefully our Christian brothers and sisters, because they claim Christianity, uh, our Christian brothers and sisters, one day as as we show that compassion, maybe someone uh, will see it's not just for those who are unborn, uh, but that compassion uh, needs to needs to be shared with all God's children. Uh, <coughs> Doctor Woods. Well, I appreciate that. I want to thank our all of our our guests. I want to bring Mia Langley, who stuck it out with us. She's here, and just want to thank each and every one of our guests who were a part of tonight's broadcast. I'd like to thank Todd McFarland, Associate General Counsel for the General Conference of Seventh Day Adventists, Alan Reinach, President of Church State Council in California. I'd like to thank Nicholas Miller, Professor of Church History at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, the General Counsel for Lake Union, the Parole Director for Lake Union as well, Timothy J. Golden. Um, Dr. Golden is at Walla Walla University, Professor of Philosophy and a lawyer in his own right. I want to thank each and every one of them for coming, as well as Nia Langley, who just re um, received her law degree from American University and will be a force to be reckoned with. Remember, I was the first one to ask to retain you. Never forget it, Esquire. Much love, much respect. And want to also recognize um, Dr. Tiffany Gillard, Dillard in OBGYN in Champaign, Illinois. Also would like to recognize Dr. Willie Hux, um, Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, who's the Dean of Practical and Applied Theology, and Claudia Allen, who always is going to just Tell it like it is. As you can see, she's unbothered and unbossed <laughs> and not afraid to let anybody know. And then last but not least, my colleague, um, Pastor Christian Josiah, who's the proud director and the CJC secretary. And uh, we really wanted to provide a relevant program, to be honest with you, in light of the decision to talk about the implications. Once again, nobody was fat checked to see who was pro-life or pro-choice but we did ask them to bring their perspective. And you heard a diverse perspective mm -hmm. from the different people that were on the panel. Some I may agree with, some you may agree with, some you disagree with, some I disagreed with, and some you agreed with. But nevertheless, you got the information and you can make an informed decision for yourself. Once again, I wanna thank everyone. And then Christian and I are going to talk about the um, program that our Conscience and Justice Council Convention coming up oh. once again, coming up again uh -huh. on September 22nd to the 25th, 
And once again, this is going to be our theme is prophetic justice, prophetic justice. Um, You will get information will be out next week, out next week, where you can register and participate at the convention. Our opening plenary session will be done by Larry Johnson. He's the founding president of Brotherhood Against Drugs, Brotherhood Against Drugs. He will be talking about drug addiction and the things that go along with drug addiction. Um, you're going to want to be a part of that and the, and, the, and the how hard it is to go through recovery, but then get reintegrated into society. <laughs> So you're going to really want to be a part of that um, conversation. That's going to kick us off Thursday night at seven o'clock p.m. Um, Larry Johnson, and then and then we have a program called the Model Minority: The Unrealistic Expectations of Asian Americans. We have Nancy Yep, the Executive Director, who for the Center for Asian Americans United for Self Empowerment, will be a part of that. We have the Great Replacement Theory and Critical Race Theory. Real or Imagine, Paul Cobb, who's a journalist from Oakland, California, Timothy Golden, who was with us tonight, and Gregory Holmes, the director of the West Region for the Southern California Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, will be a part of that. We have breakout sessions that deal with conscience, justice, um, and uh, we have a Spanish track where our breakout sessions is, will be in, a comp- in a total Spanish, I should say a Hispanic track where all of the breakouts will be in Spanish. We will also have interpreters or translators, I should say, for um, Spanish-speaking people um, throughout the whole convention. Um, We'll have a young adult track in terms for our millennials and Generation Z. We're dealing with housing affordability. And then we have a pastor's track as well. And we'll have a a workshop on ministering to the Asians, how to effectively minister to Asians. We have a plenary section by Mike McBride, the executive director of Live Free, which is a gun violence um, initiative, a gun violence, a, a gun violence, so how to reduce gun violence. He will be doing the plenary luncheon session at 1.30. He will also come up and do a workshop for pastors. The gospel admits violence. The gospel admits 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 among admits A M I D S T. My my mouth is failing. Oh, Violence and misviolence. We'll have Adventist Prophetic Robe by Dr. Zach Plantock. Justice, Human Trafficking, and Modern Day Slavery by Dr. Andrea Trustee King. And then the Young Adult Session will focus on Christian issues impacting millennials and Generation Z by Pastor Dr. Tim Gillespie. Um, our next um, session will focus on LGBTQIA and You by Orlin Johnson, the Pro Director for the North American Division. A breakout on transformative disruptors of systemic racism by Tim Golden. And then for our young adults, we'll be dealing with Food Deserts, America's Hunger Challenge by Erica R. Williams, who's the founder and executive director of A Red Circle. And then Ministering to Addicts by Larry Johnson Sr. Um, Friday evening, we'll have Praise and Worship. And we'll have a, uh, our Vespers by Bishop J. Lewis Felton from the Mount Airy Church of God in Christ in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He'll be speaking that evening. And then on Saturday, we'll be kicking off our Sabbath with Bettina Krauss, the editor of Liberty Magazine. We'll have the Lucille Byard Symposium. I'm dealing with mental fatigue, and that's sponsored by Adventist Healthcare. Our Divine Worship Hour speaker is Dr. Lola Moore Johnston, the lead pastor of Restoration Praise Center. In Bowie, Maryland, we'll be doing a homeless crisis, a homeless crisis tour dealing with bridge housing, um, with our city council member of the Eighth District of Los Angeles, the Honorable Marquise Harris Dawson, will be leading that out. We have a plenary session on the use of apology and forgiveness by Peter Robinson for the Center for Conflict Resolution, and then our Vesper thought will be done by Pastor Manny Artega from the Kaleo Seventh Day Adventist Church. Then on Sunday, we'll conclude with a plenary session from Pastor Kerwin Jones, who is a law student in his own right. And then we'll have learning laboratories, learning laboratories dealing with community development, mental wellness and community impact, bloom in terms of women, rights, and immigration and you. So we wish each and every one of you to come out 
Once again, once again, save the date. This information will be released next week on the Conscience and Justice Council. You, um, um, face, I'm sorry, website, Conscience and Justice Council website page. If you haven't done so already, please like us on, on, on Facebook and please subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. Um, Pastor Josiah, is there anything you want to say? Because I just wanted to go over the program quickly, but I always going to want you to, you know, close oh. it out your signature style <laughs> no man i just i just want to encourage everybody to, to to save that date uh september 22nd you could have left the flyer up september 2nd uh 22nd to 25th in glendale california um i just got a cheap ticket in the uh, this is a cheap ticket in the 300s uh flying into ontario um and um i'm sorry burbank burbank but you can fly to ontario uh or burbank um and and the rate is good um, listen, man, uh, everyone needs to come out. I think for some of the people who are in the chat, um, you may take, you may want to take a look at revelation 13, uh, verses 11 to 17. Um, because what we are, what we are living in, uh, and the reason that we, we, we named it prophetic justice, um, is that, is that even as we stand up, um, for the, uh, for fairness and equality and, and, and justice, as the Bible will say, and speak, uh, speak in truth to power. Um, we have to recognize that there, there is a prophetic um, voice that we should have. Uh, and then there's another voice that is also prophesied about that we need to be aware of. Uh, and that's why we have panels like this. So I'm, I'm kind of kind of surprised by, by some in the chat, uh, Dr. Woods, that uh, maybe they're not aware of 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 those who are celebrating uh, what took place today uh, is the word is a harbinger uh, of some more things that are coming down the pike. Uh, and anytime you see a, a a a a a nation or a kingdom, um, uh, you know that is that is enforcing morality. Uh, then that's something that should trouble everyone, regardless of what side of the of the fence you land on. Uh, so, so I'm going to encourage those who are are still still on here. Uh, just take a, a a quick read of Revelation 13, 11, and anywhere you see the word causes, replace it by the word forces, um, and that would give some people some context. But that's it. I'm off my hobby horse. Uh, but we're looking forward to seeing everybody September 22nd, 25. Glendale, California. Y'all can't afford to miss it. It's going to be good. It's going to be good for us. Pastor Josiah, can you close us out with prayer? Sure. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we are grateful tonight that we could have this conversation um, on what took place today, the ruling that came down uh, from our Supreme Court here of the United States. Um, Lord, we're asking, Lord, that our people uh, will have the... Um, uh, the, the scales removed from our eyes, Lord, I pray that you would open up our eyes, that we will see uh, not just what happened uh, on, on CNN and, and, and what took place in the courts and Fox News and MSNBC, uh, but Lord, I pray that the scales will, will, will be removed from our eyes so that we can see what your calling is for us in these last days. Uh, Lord, I pray that it will be clear that we will not be deceived uh, by the enemy. Uh, and that we will take a stand uh, for what's right, that we would have a heart of compassion, oh God. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us, Lord, for our frailties and forgive us of our sins and forgive us, uh, Lord, when we, when, we, when we looked left and we looked right, but we weren't looking at you. Uh, and Lord, I pray that as we turn our eyes on you, uh, that your spirit will fill us and that we would recognize uh, God's calling on our lives to be compassionate to all of God's children uh, and that we would reflect you in everything that we do. Give us a good night's rest. Wake us up to see the light uh, and the blessings of another day and another Sabbath. We ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you for being with us. Uh, God bless you really, really good. Take care and see you next time. Bye-bye.